Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. Uh, if you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. This episode uh, we're bringing you it comes as a result of our 850th show, which was actually on uh, Tuesday. But the nature of doing six shows a week is that uh, we don't always end up uh, at the end of our show even when we get to uh, a special like number 850. And there may be a point when I go ahead and I upload uh, one episode at midnight, one episode at noon. But in this case, I just decided we'll go ahead and uh, do it on the Sunday closest. And... Uh, we're going to bring you an episode of a series we brought to you before for our special. However, it's been a long time since we uh, presented it, so I'm going to give you an introduction. Uh, in 1942, Mutual introduced a program called Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic uh, ran for uh, 60 episodes, and it was a fascinating concept. What they did was they ran an anthology series. Each week, it featured a different great fictional detective. Now, some of these have been uh, well-remembered. Uh, there were episodes of the series done featuring uh, Poirot, Miss Marple, uh, Father Brown, uh, and a wa- wide variety of others that are still remembered to Today, there are others that are far more obscure. Uh, Superintendent Henry Wilson. Um, there was uh, Dr. Colin Starr. Uh, Horn Fisher. Uh, things like that. So it was a mix. But each one of these chronicling a detective who was at the time considered one of the best ever. Uh, and that was the case with today's episode. This was the sixth or fifth episode of Murder Clinic. And it tells the story, uh, a story in the adventures of Max Carados. Uh, Mr. Carados was introduced in 1914. And his stories appeared in The Strand along with Sherlock Holmes. And sometimes the editors of The Strand actually gave uh, Max Carados top billing. Believe it or not. Well, there's a lot of details about Max Carados, but before we go into any explanation, we'll play the program for you. I do want to let you know today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thanks so much for your support. Here now is the Holloway Flat Tragedy. Murder Clinic. Stories of the world's great detectives of fiction, Men Against Murder. The call. But their exploits are unique. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual invites you to Murder Clinic, where you'll meet one member of this select band in his most interesting case. The curtains part. In our amphitheater of mystery, all is dark save for one brilliant spotlight. And out of the shadows comes Max Carrados. Oh, Mr. Carrados, look out, look out, sir. There's a step down there. May I help you? No, 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 no. I can get along perfectly. Don't bother, Mr. Knight. I can see in the dark. Mr. Carrados, I thought that you... You thought I was blind? Well, you're right. I am. But I managed pretty well, thank you. Yes, I see that you do. 
But tell me, don't you find your blindness an enormous handicap in your detective work? Oh, on the contrary, it prevents me from being deceived by the obvious. I must rely on my other senses, which are more reliable, I assure you. But, Mr. Carrados, I really don't... Ah, you admit it. And yet you have eyes. Well, I shall try to convince your ears, my friend. Uh, let me tell you the story of the Holloway flat tragedy, in which those who had eyes saw nothing. <laughs> You may recall Louis Carlyle, my very good friend and associate. He was a private inquiry agent and often did me the honor of asking my help in some of his uh, more complex cases. One morning I dropped in at his office. Parkinson was with me, of course. He has been my personal attendant and my physical eyes for many years. Louis was a bit bewildered by a letter that had arrived in the morning mail. What do you make of this letter, Max? It's certainly out of the ordinary run of my correspondence. Hmm. Good bond paper. Letterhead engraved. Albert Henry Polish. Written by hand, I see. Let's see what he has to say, hmm? Important. See you alone. Absolute privacy. Recall. Ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Time A H. Gad, Max, how do you do it? I've seen it a hundred times, and I still can't believe it. <laughs> My dear Louis, why are things you can't see so mysterious to, to you? You wouldn't be surprised to watch me reading Braille, would you? Well, the ink on this paper is as clear as Braille to me. Uh, but to get back to this letter, your mysterious Mr. Coolish says he's uh, coming this morning. Perhaps I'd better go. I ah. I wish you wouldn't, Max. But he says here, absolute privacy. Mm, yes. Uh, look, Max, I have an idea. Why don't you and Parkinson go into the next office and leave the door cracked just a bit so that you can listen in? This Polish affair might interest you. Yes? What is it? Ah, uh, uh, send him in in one minute. He's here now. Please, Max. Oh, all right, Louis, if you wish it. Come on, Parkinson, let's go. Very well, sir. Pull the uh, door to, but not too close, sir, Parkinson, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, come in. Ah, that must be our friend Polish now. Mr. Carlyle? Yes. Are you alone? Why, yes, Mr. Polish, I am. Uh, I, I don't think he saw me come here. I, I was careful. Oh, come, come. Polish, control yourself. What was it you wished to see me about? Mr. Carlyle? Someone is trying to murder me. Well, well, Parkinson, this promises to be useful. Well, I hear Mr. Polish. Surely you... I know it sounds impossible, but I tell you it's true. He's made one attempt on my life already. Who? Peter. Peter? Oh, I don't know his last name. He's a foreigner. He used to be engaged to the girl. The, uh, girl you wish to marry, Mr. No, Polish? no, nothing like that. I met it already. Oh, I see. It's not what you're thinking. There's nothing between us, really. But you see, well, my wife, she's a highly nervous woman, Mr. Carlyle. Insomnia and that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, we've had separate rooms for over a year now. Yeah, I understand. Well, when Mog, uh, this girl, found out I was married... Uh, there was a scene, I suppose. Yes, most unpleasant. But nothing compared to what happened when she told her boyfriend, Peter, he tried to murder me. Are you quite sure of that, Mr. Bullock? Let me tell you what happened. That night, uh, after the row, I mean, I couldn't sleep. I was jumpy. So I thought I'd go out for a bit and walk it on. Mm -hmm. So I got up, fixed a bolster and a pillow with my bathrobe over it in the bed, and then... Uh, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> why did you do that? I told you, my wife's a highly nervous woman. Her insomnia. Oh, yes. If she came in and saw my bed empty, she'd be likely to get hysterics or something. I see. Go well, I, I fixed up this dummy in my bed and went out. I walked around maybe half an hour. When I got back, coming up the stairs, we live in a block of flats. Yes. I came face to face with a man coming out. It was Peter. What did you do? I didn't do anything. When he saw me, he crowded back against the wall and gasped. Looked as though he'd seen a ghost. Before I could say a word, he dashed past me down the stairs and out of the house like a shot. And when I got up to my room, 
Down with the booster in the bathroom I left in the bed. Stabbed through and through with a knife. Somebody had driven a knife through what he thought was my body. Well, Mr. Porris, that's plain evidence of attempted murder. This, this is a police matter. Oh, no, no, that's just one I can't have. Think what it would mean. Visits, inquiries, cross-examinations, explanations. The whole thing would come out. My home would be broken up, my whole life ruined. But what can I do, Mr. Polish? What do you want? I can tell you what I don't want, Mr. Carlyle. I don't want to be murdered. And I don't want my wife to get wind of this in this affair. Well, Mr. Polish, I, I should advise you going away for a while. It's impossible just now. My business... Well, then, be... until you can, I should advise new locks on all your doors and your windows. That means locksmiths and more questions. My wife's nervous. Oh, but surely, Mr. Polish, that's carrying consideration a bit far. Um, how did you account for the cut linen, the bolster? Oh, I've hidden them away in a drawer uh, until I can buy another sheet and cover. I managed to serve the bolster. Well, Mr. Polish, it's a unique problem. I, I don't see at the moment just how I can advise you. Come, Parkinson. This interview is practically over. Let's get out into, into the anteroom. I should like to see this foolhardy but devoted husband. Good day, Carlyle. It's been a great relief to me telling you about... I see that there's someone in the anteroom. Isn't there another way out? I don't want to be seen. Quite all right, Mr. Polish. Mr. Carrados. He's blind. I'd like you to meet him. Blind, you say? Well, all right. Oh, uh, Max, I'd like you to meet Mr. Polish. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Polish? Oh, uh, uh yes, yes. Oh, pardon my glove, won't you? You see, I'm missing part of the finger in my right hand, and I'm sensitive about it. Oh, you needn't be, Mr. Polish. I, I found physical infirmities that have their compensations. Oh, yes, sir. I can see it. Sir. I, I mean... I'm Mr. Goyne, Mr. Carlyle. I'll get in touch with you if anything further develops. Oh, yes. Goodbye, Mr. Polish. Goodbye, Goodbye, Mr. Polish. Goodbye. All right, Parkinson, you can come out from behind that screen. He's gone. Oh, come, come, Max. Why, why this elaborate device? Surely I could have told you what the fellow looks like. All oh, right, Louis, tell me, what does Mr. Polish look like? Why, Max, he's, um, medium height, average weight. He's, he's got, um, sort of brownish hair and, uh, <laughs> I see, Louis. Medium, average, a perfect picture. And, uh, what would you say, Parkinson? Uh, Mr. Polish is five foot nine, sir. He weighs in the neighborhood of eleven stone six. His hair is light brown. Several shades lighter than his brows. He has a small mole beneath the left eye. Clothing of good material, but not custom made. Glove on right hand only. Calf skin, I should say. Oh, help enough, faster than enough. Incidentally, you know, he's quite the most nervous chap I've ever met. Yes, I must have Polish seems absurd, obsessed with nerves. Very interesting. You, you must let me know how the sequel to this morning's prologue turns out. Now, uh, what I really came here to see you about, Louis. There's an auction of old Roman coins, Zendikot, next Monday. Uh, how about joining me for lunch at the club and going on to it afterwards? Hmm? You, you couldn't resist that, Max, could you? Well, neither can I. <laughs> All right, I'll be on hand. Next Monday it is. See you then. I hope this auction will be better. Listen, Louis. Holloway Flat. Isn't that the address of your remarkable caller last Thursday? I don't match it is. Uh, what was the fellow's name? Uh, uh, Polish. I want... Here, boy. Boy. Give me a paper, please. Here you are, Governor. Thank you, sir. You're right, Max. It is Polish. Why, oh, the poor devil. Found dead in his bed this morning. Uh, under in the room. A charwoman's gruesome discovery. Early this morning, they shocking injury. Uh-huh. Hey, Gabby. Gabby. Cotton Yard. Good 
good afternoon, Inspector mm. Beaver. Ah, Mr. Carrados. Um, this is my nephew, George. Just promoted to the detective division, I see. I am very glad to know you, Mr. Carrados. My uncle, Inspector Beaver, he has been telling me a lot about you. Really? Uh, but now, Uncle, hadn't we better be getting along to Holloway Flat? Oh, so you're on the Polish case, Beetle. Right. Uh, splendid. I think you'll be interested in what I have to tell you about this case. Um, we'll take a cab, and I'll give you the information as we drive along. And that's the yarn Polish told me, not four days ago. Well, a bit of luck, I should say, Mr. Carlyle. Looks as if we got our murderer before we even start. Polish didn't happen to give you the name and address of this young lady, did he? No, no, Beetle. He left something for you to find out. Well, that oughtn't to be hard, Uncle. Shop girl, kept company with a foreigner, name of Peter. Right. Well, here's the Polish flat now. Pull over, driver. I'm Inspector Beetle, Sergeant. Is this the Polish house? Yes, sir. I'll take over now. Is this Mrs. Polish? Yes. I'm Inspector Beadle, Mrs. Polish. Oh, won't you come in? These men are my associates. We'd like to see the body of your husband. Oh, it's unbelievable. Who could have done this terrible thing? My poor Albert. He was so good and so kind. When I got the wire to I, I rushed right back. Oh, he wasn't at home when this happened, Mrs. Polish. Oh, no, no. Albert had insisted I go down to Torquay to my sister for the weekend. Why did I go? If I'd only stayed, this never would have happened. Now, ma'am, you mustn't disturb yourself. You just leave everything to us. Oh, but I must be with him. My Albert. Stop her, Inspector. No, let us see him. He's in a horrible state. Uh, Mrs. Polish, you'd better... Oh, Albert. Oh, confound it, Sergeant. Get her out of here. All right, sir. Come on, Mrs. Polish. All right. Lummy, he is a nasty sight. I've seen dead ones before, but this, his face is slashed like a fancy loaf. Yeah, it looks like there's been a wild beast at work. Horrible. Well, Inspector Beetle, it fits him with what we know, what he told me himself. Revenge, rage, and sheer bloodthirstiness. Inspector. Yes, Mr. Carrados. Are you sure the corpse is Polish? Why, I uh, might have it for granted, Mr. Carrados. Why do you ask? I'm always suspicious of these murders where the victim's face is bashed beyond recognition, that's all. You're right, Max. He's fairly unrecognizable. Wait. Yes, yes, it's, it's Polish, all right. See here? A finger missing on the right hand. Remember, Max? He told us about that when he shook hands with you the other day in the office. Yes, I remember that very well. Nevertheless, Inspector, I'd compare our victim's fingerprints to those of Mr. Polish's, if I were you. But, Mr. Carrados, we haven't Polish's fingerprints on My our... dear man, there must be literally hundreds of them around this room. Everything he touched must be covered with them. Yeah, of course, sir. Stupid of me. George, attend to that. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, by the way, George, did you get the doctor's report? Uh, yes, I did, Uncle. He says it must have happened sometime between Saturday midnight and early Sunday morning. The neighbors saw him come home after taking Mr. Mrs. Polish to the station Saturday afternoon. And they saw the Sunday papers and milk bottle outside his door Sunday. He wasn't found till Mrs. Jones, the car woman, came to clean up this morning. So where was this uh, Mrs. Jones Saturday, George? She says Mrs. Polish let her go early Saturday, Mr. Carrados. What with her going away to Torquay for the weekend. I see. Poor chap, Mr. If only he'd taken my advice about changing those locks. Um, I say, Max, what are you doing there? Oh, I, I'm looking for that chief and booster. He said he'd put in the bureau drawer after that first attempt on his life. Well, that's a good point, Mr. Carrados. Yeah, let George help you. Uh, sock, uh, shirt, put over. Then let's try the next door, right? Ah, here we are. This looks like them, all crumpled up in the corner. Good, he said he'd hidden them. Yes. Here's the night cut. Oh, very, Mr. Carlyle, very interesting, but no more than we expected. Let's get on. Coming, Mr. Carrados? Uh, you go ahead. I'll join you in a moment in the living room. I'll just fold up this linen so it's tidy. You beat it? A blind man wanting things tidy, as though he could see. I say, Uncle, take a look at this. 
Here's where that Peter fellow must have come in. Here's marks on the windowsill. Mm, you're right, George. Easy as ring of roses. There's the balcony and the stairway window, not a yard away. Oh, unusual case, Inspector Beatles. This murderer seems to have gone out of his way to make things easy for you. It fits, Max. It fits. Blind, jealous rage. and Didn't have the wit to cover his tracks. Too bad Polish didn't take my advice about changing the locks on his door and windows. Come in. Yes? What is it, Constable? Sorry to disturb you, Inspector, but there's a chap out here with tools. Says he came to put in new locks. <laughs> That's locking the stable door, all right. Let's have him in. All right, you there. The Inspector wants to see you. Oh, how are you, Mr. Inspector? Blimey, what's this? Never mind that, my lad. You're a locksmith, eh? Right, Governor. My name, Joseph Beeks. We have a shop at Maidstone Crossing. Mr. Polish asked you to come here and do some work for him. That's right. Come in Friday, he did. Polite as you please. Asked me if I work Saturdays. Not as a rule, I says. Told me he needed his locks fixed. Never you mind Saturday closing, he says. Monday will do. And now here I come. One hour in the bus from my shop. It's hard lines, that's what it is, it's hard lines. That'll do, that'll do. Just get along with you now. Blimey, I'm called to do a job and then get bounced out of it. Well, that's that. Just one more thing. Sergeant, did you ask Mrs. Jones whether there'd been a fire in this grate recently? Yes, sir. Said there hadn't been one for weeks. I see. Then these ashes may be significant. Here, have a look, George. Uh, looks like some paper's been burned. Not much left. Hey, what's this? Look, it's a bit of newspaper. Oh, good boy. Let's Funny have a kind look. of printing. Why, it's Italian. Just one more sign pointing in the same direction. Peter. Yes, isn't it, Inspector Beetle? Did anyone happen to notice if he had written C. Parler Italiano in red on the wall over the bed? Why, no, Mr. Carrados. I'll go look. Oh, no, George, don't bother. When you know Mr. Carrados as well as I do, you, you will understand that although there's always something in what he says, it's not always what you think it is. That's right, Mr. Carrados. Just why do you think the murderer might have written Italian spoken on the bed? Well, obviously, Inspector, to make sure you wouldn't miss it. Oh, you're right, Mr. Carrados. This P Peter has been pretty helpful. Nothing to the case, just a simple routine job of finding the shop girl and her Italian boyfriend. Bulldog you are, Inspector. <clears throat> but, but I wonder, while you're pursuing this uh, simple routine job, uh, would you do a favor for me? Why, of course, Mr. Carrados, anything you like, if, it'll, if you think it'll help find the murderer. Thanks, Inspector. Now, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> This is Max Carrados. Oh, George, any news? Well, sir, we followed our party as you ordered. Yeah, he left the house in the afternoon, took a bus to Kensington, stayed there in the park two hours, taking a walk, then went right back and third sit. Didn't talk to anybody? Make any phone calls? No, sir, nothing. I see. Any other news? Just that we checked the fingerprints. It was Polish, all right. And Peter? No, sir, no report on Peter yet. We're hopeful. Good chat. Well, keep on with it, George. Nothing, sir. No sign of Peter. Nothing. Except one thing. Hmm? There are three locksmiths in the vicinity. Excellent. Uh, but don't get discouraged, George. Keep at it. No, sir. Nothing. It's been three weeks now, Mr. Carrados. Shall we keep at it? By your own means, George. It's absolutely vital. Absolutely. Hello? Mr. Carrados? Yes? You are right, sir. Absolutely right. Ah. They're together now at the Peacock Club. I'm phoning from a booth in the ante room. Don't let them out of your sight. No, sir, I won't. Be sure to stay there. Right, sir. I'll do that. Parkinson? Parkinson? Yes, sir? Parkinson, phone Mr. Carlyle and Inspector Beagle. Tell them to meet us in half an hour, then call a cab. 
Yes, sir. But pardon me, sir. But just where shall I tell them to meet us? Oh, of course, Parkinson, good man. I, I must be more excited than I thought. Uh, tell them to meet us in the lobby of the Peacock Club. And tell them to be sure to wait in the lobby for me. Ah, Louis, you got here before me. Hello, Max. And Inspector Beadle. Mr. Carrados? Uh, Mr. Carrados, you called it to a turn. How you ever guessed it? Now, now, no time for that now, George. Is that inside? Yes, sir. At that table there, sir. Where I'm pointing, see? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I clean forgot. But I'm blind. Never mind, George. That's the finest compliment you could have paid me. Now, what's happened so far? Well, as soon as we had them spotted, I talked to the manager. There was a little trouble, but Uncle fixed that as soon as he got here. One of our own men took over the waiter's job at their table. Oh? They seemed careful when he was around. Uh, just one thing he caught, though. Hmm? When our man came up, she was saying something about there might even be a raid here to look for Peter the Italian. And then they both laughed. Yes, uh, they would laugh. I'm going in there alone. Oh, we can't hear to that, Mr. Carrados. It's too big a risk. The man has a gun on him. We spotted that. These people are desperate. Dangerous, it would be. Don't worry, Inspector. Believe me, I'll be safe. Just one thing. Keep your eyes on me. When I unloosen my scarf, throw that master switch in the fuse box. Turn out every light in the place. It's important. But, Mr. Carrados, I, I won't hear of it. I... I... Blast it. He's in there already. Oh, we'd better get to the theater. We'll be late. Do finish your... There's no hurry. We've plenty of time. Oh, do finish your coffee, Dick. I'm nervous here. I still think it was a crazy stunt. Don't worry. It's over a month now and nothing... Why, good evening, good evening. Why, how pleasant to meet you again, Mr. Polish. Why, well, what do you mean? Oh. But of course, how stupid of me. I couldn't expect you to remember me, Mr. Polish. After all, we met only once. There must be some mistake. I never... Surely, met. Mr. Polish, you recall your visit to Mr. Carlyle's office. As you were leaving, I was sitting in the anteroom. I told you there must be some mistake. My name is not Polish. But of of course, how stupid of me. Oh, you must forgive me. You couldn't be Polish, could you? I remember now. I read somewhere the poor fellow was murdered once. Oh. Was he? Yes, terrible thing. But what an embarrassing mistake. You know, it's only the second time in my life it's happened to me. Uh, mistaking a voice, I mean. You, you see, I'm blind. Oh. Yes, miss. Quite blind. Oh. And I've always prided myself on never forgetting a voice. And now, here I am, forgetting the first... <laughs> You've made your second mistake. So if you'll excuse me... Yes, it's all coming back to me now. How could I have forgotten? Why, only the other day, Mr. Carlyle was telling me about that dreadful murder case. The police let him in on the little game they're playing. What little game? What do you mean? Well, uh, I shouldn't tell you. It's in the strictest confidence, of course. But you've been so kind. Yes, yes. What little game? Why, it's Peter. Peter after after the Italian. You mean they found him? Found him. That's just it. The police know there's no such person. That's ridiculous. Why, all the evidence in the newspaper... Oh, point... planted every bit of it. <laughs> Imagine that. Why, they even know who did do it. You see, the police have discovered that the man who called on Carlyle that day wasn't Mrs. Polish at all. He was the wife's lover. Mrs. Polish, I mean. That's very interesting. Yes, <laughs> isn't it? You see, Polish's wife and her lover had planned to murder Polish all along. So he, the lover I mean, went to Carlyle's as Polish and spun a yarn about some non-existent Italian who had already tried to kill him. <laughs> Wasn't that clever of them? <laughs> to supply the police with a murder they never could find. Why are you telling me all this? Well, uh, I thought since I'm a strictly for Polish and all that, you, you might be interested. But if I'm boring you... No, no. Go on. Of course it is. It must have been the wife who planned the whole thing. She wanted the lover and her husband's money, both. Oh. The police know that. They can't do a thing about it. That is, uh, till they find the lover. Of course, if they won't find him, it's simple. They both hang. Unless the lover turns to his evidence. And that will save his life, of course. It could. Are you sure of that? Oh, absolutely. Dick, what are you thinking? But, uh, on the other hand, if they never find him, she escapes. Phew. <laughs> it's warm in here, isn't it? I must loosen this scarf. 
Sorry, there. Max, 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 are you all right? Mr. Carrados, what happened? As you see, Inspector, Mrs. Polish has just shot and killed her partner in crime. You know, dead men tell no tales. If I hadn't prevented it by catching her wrist, we'd have found the gun in his hand and the verdict might have been suicide. Who is lost the young lady are, Mrs. Polish? You devil, you! I could kill you! No, no, my dear lady, you mean you would kill me. The two are not synonymous. <laughs> Well, Mr. Carrados, that was a very pretty trap. A bit elaborate, perhaps, but pretty. E elaborate? Yes, rather. Uh, weren't you taking a chance personally and turning out the lights that way? Oh, you forget this tonight. In the dark, it is I who can see. I who have the advantage. Without light, you were playing in my backyard. Yes, I can see how your blindness helped you there. But tell me this. How did you get onto them in the first place? I got my first clue to the truth because I didn't trust my eyes, having no eyes to trust. You remember when we found that sheet and bolster case so beautifully hidden for us to find, mm -hmm. with the knife thrust in just the right place to bear out the story Louis heard? Yes, yes, but Beetle and Carlyle and George, they saw them too. Exactly. They saw them. <laughs> but I, I smelled them. They were perfumed, my friend. They had been taken from her bed, not his. A small mistake, but a fatal one. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. W.O.R. Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case, one member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Tonight's detective was Mr. Max Carrador and was played by Alfred Shirley. Louis Carlyle was played by Horace Braille. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. The tales told on Murder Clinic are adapted by authors Lee Wright and John A. Batson. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Elvin Flanagan. This is Frank Knight speaking. the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, a very neat solution. And uh, I had to love the gentle way he ribbed the police about being taken in by this uh, ruse that he saw through. Really a, a great concept. It's been done since, but uh, this was, as far as I know, the original blind detective story. There were four separate Max Carados books published. Uh, there was Max Carados uh, in 1914, The Eyes of Max Carados Max, uh, in 1923, The Max Carados Mysteries in 1927, and The Bravo of London in 1934, which was actually a full-fledged novel. And uh, Carados has appeared in uh, quite a few, in a few, I shouldn't say quite a few, but in a few other uh, media productions. Uh, one of them was on the uh, television series The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes uh, from the 1970s. Uh, and that's been a series I've always been somewhat fascinated with because they had a lot of forgotten detectives in that series. Well, uh, including uh, Lady Molly of Scotland Yard, which has always seemed like an interesting uh, concept from uh, Baroness Orksey, who, of course, wrote The Scarlet Pimpernel. 
And of course, Alfred Shirley, who played Max Carados in this episode, uh, would have a few other claims as to fame as well. Uh, long-time listeners of the show will remember him as the first Dr. Watson to John Stanley's Holmes. He also played in uh, the CBS radio series as a Hearthstone of the Death Squad. All right, well, that'll do it for today. We'll be back with you on Monday with Frank Race. Uh, in the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.